my parents exposed me to a lot of different movies growing up, the overwhelming majority of them being from the pre-2000s, movies that my parents saw and loved when they were young. Over the years, my dad told me stories about going to see films in theaters when he was a kid, specifically the Star Wars films. Now, I've grown up with these movies, and I've always loved the original trilogy, but I had only ever watched them at home on TV. My dad would tell me these great stories about him going to see movies several times each in theaters. And I was so jealous. To have such a lasting impact on a person originate from a movie theater of all places was a bit inspiring for me. I never thought that I would be able to experience something quite on the same level as that. That is, until Star Wars The Force Awakens debuted in town. I was ecstatic. I could hardly stay still as I was sitting in my chair at Cineplex waiting for the film to begin. The lights dimmed and the music started. I could feel my heart beating all throughout my body, down to my fingertips. And then... Title crawl. The words scrolled faster on the big screen than I would have expected, but in that moment, it felt like I was watching in slow motion. It was breathtaking. To be honest, I almost cried I was so happy. So I sat there, with the biggest, goofiest smile on my face, gripping the armrests to keep from jumping up for what felt like hours on end. That was something that has vividly stayed with me for years, and will continue to do so for the rest of my life. And I hope that one day I can look back on that memory and share it with my own children. Because if there's one thing about me that I want to be common knowledge throughout my family, it's that I love old movies. Hello, film fans. I'm Derek, and I love old movies. We've got Sam the Sidekick here. Hello. Welcome to episode four of our podcast, and part two of our special two-part Frankenstein episodes. Last week, we looked at Son of Frankenstein and found ourselves in total agreement as to its awesomeness. Far from just being a tired entry in a played-out, past-its-prime series, it was, in fact, a film you could get excited about. And we did. This week, we are looking at the direct sequel to Son of, and the fourth film in the series, ghost of frankenstein it's okay if you don't get excited about this one we didn't we tried but we didn't you had that nostalgia thing about it going in yeah but still that's going into it excited not coming out two different things very but we're committed to doing the thing we said we are looking at them both so that is what we are going to do we are podcasters of our word we declared our principles way back in episode one Uh, actually that was just you I was speaking on your behalf. No. On our behalf. No. I see how it is. Do you want to tell everyone your story about Ghost of Frankenstein? I can do that. But first, let's start with a big shout out to our listeners and subscribers. Yes. Thanks for being there and checking our show out. And for liking us on all the socials. The socials are the key. And runtime. The more you listen, the better it is. That's for sure. And by checking us out not only here on the podcast, but also on the Facebook and the Instagram, you can get extra fun facts, as well as little bonuses on films we might be watching, but aren't podcasting about. There are a lot of those. You ain't lying. So if you like the show, be sure to hit like, subscribe, and share. It's the best way for what we do to reach more people. So if you think other people would like this, then definitely do that. Yes. And get in touch with us on all the socials. Even more, yes. On Facebook. I Love Old Movies, the podcast. Instagram. I Love Old Movies, the podcast. Or send us an email. I Love Old Movies, the podcast at gmail.com. All one word. Oh, yeah. So back to Ghost of Frankenstein. It's fair to say we are a bit conflicted about this one. Yes, but I have a two-part theory as to why that is. Oh, go on. Okay, so first off, Son of was so good. The next film was always going to be a letdown. Okay, I'm with you on that. And secondly, you had this whole childhood memory 
associating this film with an event from your childhood. And it was never going to be able to live up to that. That is true. Nothing is really as good as you remember it being from your childhood. Tell us the story. All right. So I've mentioned previously that where I grew up, there wasn't much in the way of available entertainment. But the Legion Hall was sort of a hub for fun events that might occur throughout the year. There were the spring and fall film series, the big meet and greet with Santa Claus after the parade, and somewhere along the way they started up Halloween parties for the kids. On Halloween? Yeah. It was like a drop-in with activities and treats, and you could go trick-or-treating, stop off, see some friends, have some fun, play some games, win some prizes, and then head back out to gather more candy. Sounds cool. It wasn't bad, honestly. The centerpiece of the night at the Legion would be a short movie they would show. Now, let me back up a bit. These were the days before Blu-rays, before DVDs, before VCRs, and we didn't have cable TV in our town. But what people did have, not only in our town, but anywhere, were 8mm movie cameras. People just owned these little movie cameras that shot actual film, and that's how you documented your special occasions. If you wanted moving video, you had a Super 8 camera. But to watch those films, you needed, in your home, a little projector and a screen. That sounds awesome. It was pretty cool. 8mm reels were pretty short, just a few minutes long. But this was a big form of family entertainment and memory making from the 1950s to the 1970s. Did you have one? We did not. In fact, I didn't know anyone at the time who did. But I knew of these things from the ads in the back of horror magazines like Creepy and Eerie. There were these mail-away ads where you could order actual feature films, transferred to 8mm, and watch them in your home, projected on your own screen. I want this. Can we get this? How can we get this? But there was a catch. Because 8mm was a lot smaller than whatever films were shot on, 35mm being common, the version of the film you got was incredibly cut down. How short are we talking? Short. 10 minutes, maybe. For a movie? Yeah. For a whole movie? That's what I'm saying. Preposterous. But, okay. Continue. So at these parties, they had these kinds of movies to show. I only ever saw two of them, and not on the same night, so I don't know if they did multiple features or anything. Okay, and what did you see? The first one was Star Wars. And back then, we just called it Star Wars. No Episode Four, no A New Hope, no real expectation of Empire Strikes Back ever happening, just Star Wars. In ten minutes? Thereabouts. How do you even do that? So, one big edit they made was to make it look like when the Millennium Falcon escapes the Death Star and shoots those TIE fighters. It's basically the same fight as when the X-Wings attack the Death Star. It was like Luke teleported from the Falcon into an X-Wing. But that's not how the story even goes. Consider, in my hometown, that would have been many people's first experience seeing a Star Wars movie. Holy crap. The next year, though? The Trial of Frankenstein. Oh, that's awesome. I was... Uh, wait a minute. Trial of Frankenstein? Yeah. There is no trial of Frankenstein. Oh, but there is. See, when Ghost of Frankenstein was cut down to 8mm, they gave it a new title, which focused what was actually in the cut. The trial scene. Exactly. But what about the ghost? Nope. They literally turned a film called Ghost of Frankenstein into another film that didn't even have the ghost in it? And that was my first experience seeing a universal horror film. And was it in the book you got from the library? No, not at all. Ghost was mentioned, but not Trial. I didn't piece it all together that they were the same film for some time. Okay. Well, let's talk about the people, shall we? Let's. Ghost of Frankenstein was directed by Earl C. Kenton, who got his start in the filmmaking business working for Max Sennett as one of the Keystone Cops. That led to him getting directing opportunities, which became the focus of his career, directing shorts and features, for years before moving into television in the 1950s. Kenton doesn't have a filmography filled with hits, but he made a fair amount of horror movies, such as Island of the Lost Souls in 1932, and he followed Ghost of Frankenstein with House of Frankenstein and House of Dracula, he also directed what is considered to be one of Abbott and Costello's best films, Pardon My Sarong. Kenton was nominated for three Hugo Awards in the Best Dramatic Presentation category, 
for Ghost, and for each of the House Of films. I feel the bar for those nominations must have been pretty low. Well, get this. The year he was nominated for Ghost of Frankenstein, that Hugo was won by Bambi. Bambi? (laughs) Yep. How was there a category of award where Bambi and Ghost of Frankenstein could both be nominated? I do not know. How is Bambi a science fiction? Well, clearly it's not. Bambi. She... Not that Ghost of should have won anything. No, no, that's not the point. There are two atrocities here. One, Ghost of was nominated for an award, and two, Bambi won it. Neither of those things make sense. Well, we could do Bambi next. We won't be doing that. Now, Ghost of Frankenstein was written by Canadian comedy writer Scott Darling, who had a long and prolific career as a screenwriter and silent film director. Most notably, he wrote four Laurel and Hardy films, and Sherlock Holmes and the Secret Weapon, starring Basil Rathbone. Both the Sherlock Holmes film and Ghost of Frankenstein came out about the same time and were financially successful. He wrote over 200 scripts over a 30-year span that were used to produce serials, B-films, and major studio productions. But unlike many of his contemporaries, he didn't transition into television. Why is that? That's because he disappeared. Really? He and his wife were going through a divorce, and the day he was to appear in court, they found his car parked on a beach and his wallet floating in the ocean. They searched for him, but he was never seen again, and it's presumed he took his own life. Wow. Darling never won any awards, but was nominated for that same Hugo in 1943 with Kenton. Well, our big star is Sir Cedric Hardwick, who plays Ludwig von Frankenstein. You don't get many sirs in horror movies. Not at all. And he was a sir at the time to boot, having been knighted in 1934. An accomplished stage actor, both before and after World War I, Hardwick became an in-demand film actor, first in England and then in the United States in the 1930s. Notable films for him include The Hunchback of Notre Dame, Stanley and Livingston, Rope, The Ten Commandments, and Around the World in 80 Days. Those last two appear in our opening montage. Also sometimes hired for his voice alone, Hardwick was the narrator of such films as War of the Worlds and The Picture of Dorian Gray. He won a National Board of Review Award in 1943 for his performances in The Cross of Lorraine and The Moon is Down. One wonders what such a distinguished and accomplished actor was doing in this film. Lon Chaney Jr. plays the monster in this film, as he, Evelyn Ankers, and Bella Lugosi all migrated over from the production of The Wolfman to work on this film. Chaney was the new star in waiting, and with his legendary name, was ready to claim his mantle as the new monster actor in Hollywood. Born into showbiz royalty, Chaney avoided adopting his father's name until it was clear that it would help his career significantly. His big breakthrough role was playing Lenny in 1939's Of Mice and Men, but his stardom hit full stride with The Wolfman in 1941, giving Chaney a signature role that he would play five times. Chaney is the only actor to play all four of the classic movie monsters, appearing not only as Frankenstein in The Wolfman, but also as the mummy Karis in The Mummy's Tomb, and as Count Alucard in Son of Dracula. That is cool. Get it? Alucard. It's Dracula spelled backwards. (laughs) Yeah, that's great. We already talked about Bela Lugosi, so shall we move on? All right. What's uh, the story on our ratings, Sam? So for Ghost of Frankenstein, the IMDb rating is 6.1. That high? Huh. The Rotten Tomatoes audience score is 40%, and the tomato meter is 75%, with 12 reviews. And awards? Yeah, no. Let's do it. Yes. We open on title cards superimposed over a dreary, swampy forest. The music is very big, all tense violins and blaring horns. If the music stays this good, we will be in good shape. It won't. At the Frankenstein Town Hall, the councilmen are meeting, and they have decided that there is a curse upon the village. And that's why they have no tourists, and that is why their crops all die. Poor superstitious villagers. Hey, wait a minute. Didn't the monster kill that one guy in the last film? 
<laughs> yes. In a classic universal, let's recycle the cast moment, both of the murdered councilmen are back, possibly playing different characters who have the exact same jobs. We learn that the sulfur pit hardened over, trapping the monster inside. Yet somehow the 800 degree temperature not incinerating him. He'd still be there swimming around if it hadn't hardened over. Igor survived also, since if a hanging can't kill him, why would a hail of bullets? And he sits there, by the hardened pit, playing his horn. Waiting for his friend. Sulfur friend! Immortal friend! Friend! The citizens decide to blow up the castle once and for all, and three minutes in, we have our first angry mob. Mm -hmm. Say what you will about this movie, and we will. The angry mob quotient is incredible. Oh yeah. If you are the sort of film fan who's always saying, I liked it, but there wasn't enough angry mob for me. Well, this movie has you covered. The angry mob attacks the castle and Igor hurls pieces of broken battlements at them. The battlements smash into the ground violently, so the villagers use dynamite and literally start blowing up everything. The castle, what's left of the lab, there's a flurry of explosions. This is literally what they mean when they say, let's start things off with a bang. But the last explosion cracks open the sulfur pit and the monster gets out. He looks quite a bit different than the last time we saw him, since he's being played by a new actor. But also, his clothes are different. And that makes no sense. We get the monster about four minutes into this film. There's not been one wasted moment so far. In all the hubbub, Igor and the monster flee the mob unseen. But while they're making good their escape, the monster is struck by lightning. Now, in the last movie, they said this happened. But it was a bad thing, like it put the monster into a coma. He seems fine now. Just fine. Igor decides that the two need to go see Ludwig, the old doctor's second son, since he knows all the dad's secrets. What happened to Wolf? He has the secrets. He literally has the notebooks. Wait, I'm confused. Does the lightning help the monster or not? In the next town over, Vissaria, lives Ludwig von Frankenstein, MD. He treats diseases of the mind. But it is soon explained that what they really do is remove brains from heads and replace them. Everyone did that back then. Uh, Dr. Frankenstein, the second much, much, much older son of Henry Frankenstein, has two assistants, Dr. Kettering and Dr. Bomer, who is played by Lionel Atwell. It seems Dr. Bomer trained Dr. Frankenstein, but the pupil has surpassed the master, and there is some tension between them. I just love that the inspector in the town of Frankenstein has a doppelganger who lives one town over and is a flunky to a doctor named Frankenstein. Lionel Atwill is the actor that plays both the inspector in Son of and the doctor assistant in Ghost of. Lionel Atwill, forever Frankenstein stooge and all-around fall guy. Things are making less sense by the minute. What happened to our excellent opening scene? The monster and Igor just stroll into town. No one in Viserys seems to really care that much or notice them. Some boys bully a girl, and the monster comes to chase the bullies away and get the girl's ball back. Okay, early impressions. Lon Chaney Jr. looks good, but doesn't have Karloff's pathos. He plays the monster as unemotional instead of having really complex emotions. Reducing the monster to a largely unfeeling thing? That's a downgrade. Still can't talk, either. The monster takes the girl to the rooftops, and also maybe kills one or two guys, and a mob forms. It had been a while. We needed another mob. The mob overwhelms the monster, and he is arrested. We then meet Elsa, who is Ludwig Frankenstein's daughter. Wait, who names their daughter after their brother's wife? Or is this more a who marries a girl with the same name as his niece? How close are Wolf and Ludwig? They lived a village away, and they never visited. Or referred to each other. And the local police want Dr. Frankenstein to work with Monster. It all worked out perfectly. But then Igor comes a-calling, and he suggests that they repair the body and mind of the creature. The monster shall not ruin my life, Ludwig says. Oh, Ludwig, how wrong you are. Igor blackmails him, threatening to reveal his lineage to the monster. Why does that work? Are we supposed to believe that Ludwig, whose last name is Frankenstein, and who lives near the village of Frankenstein, where it is said that two separate Dr. Frankensteins brought a monster to life, which is also called Frankenstein, and no one in Viseria has ever suspected in the slightest that Ludwig Frankenstein 
might be connected somehow to all that? Well, this was pre-internet. Yeah, but not pre-literacy. Not pre-communication. Well, it just so happens that Ludwig has Henry's diary. Oh. And Wolf's diary. No explanation given. No explanation needed. The monster goes on trial in a courtroom. He's interrogated, but he answers no questions. They bring in the little girl to handle the interrogation. Still nothing. But we do get the cute moment of Crown Prosecutor Little Girl. The trial of Frankenstein. Uh-huh. Ludwig shows up, the monster breaks free, it runs off with Igor, and they make a getaway, while a mob chases them. Back at Ludwig's mansion, Elsa decides out of the blue to go through his desk, and she finds the diary. You know, the music has been cheesy and bad since the intro. Yep. We see a really cool montage from the first Frankenstein movie as she reads the diary. Then the monster and Igor show up. They break in and kill Kettering. Ludwig has his mansion set up so he can deliver knockout gas into rooms, and that fixes everything. Gas. For all your home defense solutions. Now, as far as skeletons in the closet go, the monster is a big one. Bomer and Ludwig plan to destroy the creature, unmaking him limb by limb. Full dissection. Would this be murder, they wonder? Nah, it's not human. And yet, Bomer can't bring himself to unmake life. And he refuses to help. This is an unexpectedly heavy ethical topic they're talking about. But then, the ghost arrives. It's the ghost of Henry. Without looking remotely like Henry, and not being played by the same actor. And that's because Colin Clive died in 1937 and wasn't available to be in the film. The ghost asks, Would you destroy that which I created? Ludwig's essential problem here is that his dad discovered the secret of life. But it's brought nothing but death. The ghost wants Ludwig to cure the brain, since that's his specialty, and the brain is known to be flawed. Well, why not switch brains? Why not indeed? Now this is a plan Bomer can get behind. But as a viewer, I find myself wondering, was it really a ghost or a manifestation of the old Frankenstein ego, giving himself permission to do what he already wanted to do, which is play God? They decide to use the brain of the dead doctor, Kettering, but Igor hates this whole plan. He thinks his brain makes more sense since his neck is broken, and Wolf shot him up. Ludwig's like, nah. We then get our obligatory montage of science lab stuff. No Frankenstein movie can be without it. The next day, Igor works on Bomer. His argument is essentially, don't use Kettering, use me. Together we would rule the world. Bomer is clearly ambitious and greedy, and he really wants to outdo Frankenstein. That night, the police show up. They can't find the monster, so they figure someone is providing refuge. And they want to speak to Kettering. Ludwig spins some flimsy lies, which leads to the police wanting to search the place. They find the secret passageway into the dungeon, just like that. These cops are pretty good. And they've clearly been in secret dungeons before, because then they find the secret room in the secret dungeon. And they do this with alacrity. But... The monster isn't there, and neither is Igor. That's because the monster has gone to town to visit the little girl. And by visit, we mean sneak into her bedroom and take her. Always with the kids. Oh, and on his way out, he burns her family's house down. In a surprising and perverse twist, the monster wants the little girl's brain. Igor tries to explain his plan, but monster just crushes him. The monster gives the girl to Ludwig who passes her to Elsa and lets the monster think all is good, they will do what he wants. The monster is anesthetized and surgery begins. Ludwig removes the monster's brain while Bomer removes Igor's. Igor saying, better death than a life like this. But Ludwig thinks it's Kettering's brain. He asks, will he object to living in that human junk heap? After the surgery, Ludwig thanks Bomer and gives him lots of credit. And Bomer's heart grows three sizes. Where did the monster's brain go? Meh. The brain of Frankenstein. That could be the next sequel. <laughs> Not a bad idea. Two weeks later, the girl's father assumes that his daughter is dead and probably taken by the monster. Why can no one find the monster? Everyone immediately assumes he's being sheltered by Frankenstein. Of course. Despite there being no evidence of this, and the fact that the police had already searched his home, finding nothing. 
It's a bit of a logic leap, but that's okay, because we get an angry mob. Everyone makes quick, perfect deductions in this film. I don't care. I do love a good angry mob. Wait, why does Elsa still have the kid? It's been two weeks. They just kept the little girl all this time? In the same clothes, wrapped in the same blanket. The authorities want to know about Kettering, and the girl, and the monster, once and for all. Ludwig explains, the monster killed Kettering, and Kettering's brain is in the monster. And he proclaims, I have restored the good name of Frankenstein. In a town where we are led to believe that no one knows that Frankenstein is anything but an honorable name. But then the monster speaks, and he says, I am Igor. And Ludwig is like, oh crap, I've created 100 times the monster my father did. Igor spares Ludwig, but the mob breaks in. Bomer uses the gas. Elsa is like, uh, oh, here's your daughter, by the way. And the father doesn't say a thing. He's just like, oh, thanks. This is a guy who just a few scenes ago thought his daughter was dead. The Igor monster starts killing Ludwig, and then suddenly goes blind. Blood type incompatibility. Of course, Igor's blood and the monster's blood don't work together. So they went blind. Oldest trick in the book. So Igor goes mad and kills Bomer. He also crashes into every single thing in the lab, creating fire and explosions. The mansion is filled with flames, and the Igor monster is buried in the collapsing bits. One of the police guys and Elsa run off all lovey. They walk away from a burning house into a beautiful sunrise. The end. What? Wow. Is it just me that feels that that was really rushed? Super rushed. Was that even an hour? 67 minute runtime. That's barely a TV show episode these days. Bah. Bah, I say. <laughs> okay. Pros and cons. Let's do it. Here are my pros. Lon Chaney's appearance. While not exactly the look we are used to, Chaney's stature and appearance in costume and makeup make him an imposing figure. Shot selection, angles, and some specially created set pieces like small door frames and low ceilings make him seem even more impressive. Number two, the opening scene. It was so jam-packed with plot, characters, and action, it felt like opening the film with a climax. In the first five minutes, we got the monster, an angry mob, and a bunch of explosions. That is good stuff. And three, there was an honest attempt to build the mythology of the Frankenstein world, and there are many references to previous films, and enough new things added to, the, to take the series in a new direction, if that's what they wanted to do. And my cons. The logic in this movie. It feels like the writers didn't understand the story they were telling. The mythology is referred to honestly and faithfully until it's not, and holes in the plot are far too many. How does Ludwig have the diaries? How could no one associate him with the Frankenstein monster or old Dr. Frankenstein in the neighboring village of Frankenstein? Why was the ghostly vision of Henry played by a different actor than Colin Clive, who we had just seen in the flashback? It seems like they could have done that more elegantly. Too often, the film is ridiculous. Two, Lon Chaney's performance. While Junior looked great, he is no Karloff in the acting department. His portrayal of the creature went beyond inhuman and all the way to basically inanimate. He moves, but he's not alive. There's nothing in there. Nobody's home. And his arm flailing is the worst. Three, the music, the ending, Lionel Atwell's performance, the too short runtime. I could probably list so many more cons that that's probably the biggest con of them all. And we'd choose just three. Regrettably, this is a don't watch for me. It's an incredibly weak and poorly scripted fourth film, and after three strong ones, that's a shame. All right, here are my pros. One, the flashback scene. I thought the way the scene from the original movie was cut in was really well done. The fact that it overlapped shots of the diary was very cool. Two, the opening. It was just so jam-packed with everything. We were given an angry mob the monster, explosions, and right in the first five minutes of the film. Three. How direct of a follow-up to Son of Frankenstein it is. I really like that it didn't waste any time and was taking place almost immediately after the previous film. Now my cons. One. Lon Chaney Jr. He did not stand up to Boris Karloff from the previous movie. 
where Karloff could convey so much raw emotion to the audience that we could feel bad for him, Cheney showed as much emotion as a brick wall. 2. Ludwig Frankenstein Where did he come from? How did he get his father's and Wolf's diaries? The character just felt out of place, so I couldn't make myself care for him. 3. The Runtime The film was just way too short. Everything felt too rushed and condensed to actually enjoy it. Unfortunately, this is a don't watch, especially after Son of. Okay. Okay. And we need to recalibrate our master list after the last two films. I put Son of Frankenstein at the top, uh, ahead of Too Late for Tears, and I put Ghost at the bottom, below Rope of Sand. Ghost is totally at the bottom for me. It's not even close. And what about Son of? I liked it more than Rope of Sand. You know what? Above Too Late for Tears as well. I feel like I'm happy with that. It's close though. Too Late for Tears is really good. But yeah, Son of goes to the top. We are in agreement. This is not an everyday thing. No, that is true. Well, that's it for us, and that's it for episode four, and that is it for our two-part look at Son of and Ghost of Frankenstein. Remember, as always, if you liked what you heard today, don't keep it to yourself. Tell your friends. Tell your enemies. You never know. They just might like Frankenstein as much as you do. Maybe even more. For Sam the Sidekick, I'm Derek, and I love old movies. Sound effects used for I Love Old Movies, the podcast, come from freefx.co.uk. Images are found through the Creative Commons. And our theme song, Burning Bridges, comes from The Crux.